So I thought it might be useful to talk about personal security details. They're in the news a lot right now. Sadly topical. With the attempted assassination of former President Donald Trump. And I'm not going to get political on this. I'm not going to tell you how to think on this unlike many outlets. I'm not going to get into whether it's negligence or malice or some degree in combination of both or neither. It's just a thing that happens. I'm not here to get into that or the politics to tell you who to vote for. There's plenty of people telling you that stuff. I'm here to tell you as somebody that's lived a lifetime, my adult life anyway, as a professional gunfighter and worked a lot, a lot of personal security details kind of how that works and how personal security details operate. Now you can glean from this with the current situation. You can glean from this if you're trying to set up a tactical team or if you just want a better understanding of how these things work in the real world from somebody that has real world first-hand experience. I thought it would be a way to contribute to give some knowledge without trying to influence how you think or what you believe as far as politics go. I put my faith in God and not government. What's up, guys? A little cross-pollination here. This originally aired on Alpha Male Podcast. Now, I'd like to believe that everybody that listens to Gunfighter Life listens to Alpha Male, but I'm not sure that that's true. And, let me be real with you, I'm working two jobs, and I'm pretty busy. Still trying to be, by God's grace, devoted to God and reading His Word, praying, being a good husband to my wife all the things. So I'm going to cross-pollinate here and put this out on Gunfighter Life as well. With that, I'm going to put in a real rapid-fire, quick, you know, 50,000-foot fly overview of my bio, and then I'll talk about some more specific aspects as is germane to personal security details. Blessed to have served in military law enforcement combat veteran, private contractor, competition shooter, lifelong hunter, guide, blessed by God that he got me through all those things so I could share this firsthand training, knowledge, experience with you to serve you today. Let's dive into the podcast. All right, guys. So in addition to all that, uh, specifically when I was the commander of a tactical team to stop active shooters, a big chunk of that, not all of it, but a big chunk of that was personal security detail work. EP protection, executive protection. I worked with Secret Service. I worked with all manner of other agencies. We would pr- protect you know, dignitaries, political people. Mo- more for me... We did that too, but more for me was celebrities. And I'm not going to drop names or anything like that, but the biggest of the big celebrities. If you count big as in like number of views, followers, record sales, the, you know, big A-list celebrities, movie stars, and musicians from country music to rapists or rappers as you might call them. Got a lot of experience doing that. Uh, more, more missions than I probably could remember if I tried. A lot of doing that. And let me be clear on this. I feel this way now, and I felt this way at the time. And I would tell my men similar things to this: is that person that we're protecting, what you'd call on the inside a lot of times, the principal or the asset. Right to use that vernacular, but the person you're trying to protect, put it in common speak. I don't think their life is any more valuable than the little girl or the 80-year-old woman or anything else. But by their very nature, they attract large crowds of people. Which in and of itself is dangerous. More dangerous than a normal person. Not that their life is any more valuable. Also, by the very nature of their life, stalkers, fans, people that really love them and are delusional, it's people that really, really vehemently hate them. They have different risks than the average day-to-day person. 
they're no more valuable to me. But that was part of our mission to protect these people. And there's two, the, it bifurcates, right? The, the kind of protection of VIPs, the principal, whatever, it kind of delineates into two major categories. You have protection of the arena, as I like to call it, the arena, the field, the chessboard, the facility, the area, and you have protection of the actual physical human being. Both of these are obviously important. Also, bifurcated into two, split into two, is what you do before the mission and what you do during the mission. Now you do an after action report after the mission, but what's done is done. To prevent somebody from getting hurt, you have before the mission planning and you have things on the fly and things that happen during the actual mission. For this, some acronyms that I use and you may want to be familiar with that is, well, you know, be a surprise to no infantry non-commissioned officer or officer, BAMSIS, begin the planning, arrange recon, make reconnaissance, complete the plan, issue the order, and supervise. And I was the commander or a team leader in doing this. You might want to be familiar with that acronym if you want to glean from this how to do these type of things or how they are actually done. Another acronym common in this lifestyle is SMEAC, which is not some kind of weird transmitted disease. SMEAC is a acronym for doing this kind of mission, which stands for Situation, Mission, Execution, Administration and Logistics, Command and Signal. I don't know how long it's been around, but I remember when I joined uh, the Marine Corps in 2001 when I started doing NCO type stuff, whatever year that was. This stuff was well established. It, I don't know how far it goes back. But it is a pretty legit. If you're going to write an operations order, an op order, an op order, depending on how tactical you want to be. Somebody says the five paragraph order, that's what that is. You'll have sub acronyms because the military loves acronyms. Law enforcement loves acronyms inside of this, like MCOLA, uh, Enemy's Most Likely Course of Action, Enemy's Most Dangerous Course of Action. Like, if you were the enemy, what is the most likely thing that you would do? What's the easiest way to attack? Also, what's the most dangerous course of action? Like, what's the worst case scenario you can possibly think of? Let's tabletop this, let's discuss this. What's like the worst case scenario? This all should be done in the pre-planning stage. And before there's ever, except for you doing reconnaissance, before there's boots on the ground, before this event ever takes place, days, weeks, months before, you should have these operations orders. And everybody should know them, not just you. Like the guys on your team, they should know them. In this is our contingency plans. Things like rally points and objective rally points. Because when bad things happen, comms can be a mess, which we'll get into a little bit later. But if comms are down, where does everybody meet up at? If there are casualties, where's the mass casualty evacuation point? If our first rally point doesn't work or we have to rally up before we get to the actual rally point, where's our objective rally point? Administrative and logistics. Where are all the tourniquets, right? At events like this, you probably should have a bunch of tourniquets, a bunch of tac med, a bunch of that stuff. Where is that stage? Who's got those duffel bags full of tourniquets and pressure dressings and all that stuff? All the stuff that you just want to think about guns and ammo and all this stuff if you're one of the tactical guys. And like, how do my boots look with this Gucci, you know, black multicam? But like, what do you do when somebody needs a pee break? <laughs> like if they're on post for 8 hours, if they're standing up perimeter for 12 hours in the sun, how do you get them cold water? How do you get them a break so they don't pass out? Mundane things like that because I don't care who you are, you're probably not staying hyper vigilant for 12 hours at a time. So those kind of things, all those little tedious stuff as the commander as I was, those kind of things get hammered out in administrative and logistics. That stuff is important. 
Logistics is important. Where are the tourniquets? Where is the water? What happens if somebody needs a break? Where are all your guys stationed at? Let's say the arena. Whatever area it's going to be. Is it a, is it a, an amphitheater with you know tens of thousands of people in it? Is it an outdoor arena? Is it a concert venue? Is it a nightclub? You know what kind of arena is it? What are your likely avenues of approach? What are your best avenues for egress? How is the bad guy most likely to get in? Where is he most likely to exit if that's the case? Where is the best place for you to enter and exit? And what's a contingency if those things are messed up? I've said this before. I have a whole other podcast, Gunfighter Life, which I'll probably put this out, some cross-pollination on both. But gunfighting is a thinking man's game. You generally don't get to be a old man in gunfighting without, number one, protection and provision from the father, blessings, and two, thinking. There's a time and a place for brute strength and punching somebody as hard as you can in the face, breaking their nose. There's also a time for thinking. Gunfighting is a thinking man's game. All the stuff I'm talking about now, strategy, thinking. It's like 4D chess where the loser dies. It's a thinking man's game. Again, enemies most likely course of action. If you were the bad guy, and we would literally sit down on tabletop just because I was a commander, didn't mean I was the only one with a brain. We would literally have like blueprints or a map, and we'd draw stuff out and be like, okay, this is the arena. If you were the bad guy, what would you do? Does anybody else have any thoughts? And if I had something, I'd say, well, have you thought about this? What if this happened? Then what? <clears throat> but, you know, where are the avenues of approach? Where are likely firing positions what are the ranges and each individual person on their on my team i hired professional gunfighters like they should know how far away can you make a shot how far away can you not make a shot what are our assets how many people just have handguns how many people have handguns and rifles where are my riflemen going to be deployed where are likely ambush areas what are our camp counter ambush areas all these things should go into pre-mission planning. And you would issue what's called an operations order. And then you would sit down with your team, maybe just your team, and you would hash this out and you would explain this. And much like a classroom, do you have any questions? And sometimes they'll have really good questions that I didn't even think of. Right? I'm not the keeper of all good ideas. One of the parts of being a good leader in wisdom is to realize when you... When somebody else has a better idea than you. They're like, hey, what about this? And I'm like, yeah, you know what? That's that's a good idea. We should probably do that. Or I thought about that, but we can't do that, and here's why. But, you know, there's a time and a place, and there's a clear chain of command. But that doesn't mean that you're a, a dictator that thinks you know everything. But you'll sit down with this operations order, and you'll explain it to your team. And you should also have contingency plans, backup. Also... In part of this is me as the commander, or maybe I'll delegate this, but I got to reach out. And here's something that's germane to today that I, I want you to understand. There are often many, many organizations working one event. You could have, you could have Secret Service. You could have State Police. You could have local police. You could have various other federal agencies. FBI, DHS. You could also have various contingents of private armed unarmed security. Up to and including that person's own private security detail. Like, I didn't work for a specific person. I would work in conjunction with these celebrities actual specific bodyguards which they would likely have so that's all stuff that we should know ahead of time but comms are tough right who's that guy with a gun you know the guy that looks like a thug that's got a gun is he a gangbanger or from a rival gang or is that the guy that you're trying to protect rapper nasty lyrics mick metal face that's his 
private security guard that he grew up with. Who, if you were still working as LAPD, you'd probably jack up for drug possession. But that's his private security guy. And these guys may or may not all be on the same page. You should, if you're running your contingent, have pictures of your guy. Literally, I would make dossiers of my guys. I literally had dossiers on my guys. And whoever was working the mission, I would send to the other teams. These are my guys. This is what they look like. One, to prevent friendly fire. Like, please don't shoot my guys in the face. Don't shoot me in the back when I'm up on a roof with a gun. This is what I look like. This is what I'm going to be wearing. This is a picture of me. This is my dossier. This is my contact info. That's what should be done. That said, not everybody does that. And you would assume that everybody would have all these comms hammered out, but then everybody shows up and you realize that, oh, whatever local department... You guys are all on whatever radio frequency. However, this department, they're, they don't even have digital radios. They're stuck on old analog radios. We can't even talk to them. What should happen is somebody from your department and their department should swap radios. Like the head people should swap radios. And that way you can communicate with each other. Even so, these things take time. Things don't always happen that re- well in the real world. And I should mention one of the unsung heroes that should be operating on these things are what's called a SIC or a SOC, depending on the acronym, but Security Operations Command. An incident command center, like the the communication nervous system of this event. There should be some, for lack of a better term, computer nerd people that are talking with everybody and gathering intel in a real world, you know, almost immediate timely response manner coordinating all these things and all these assets there should be that well that said you know with even with the best planning things can happen you could have all your plans worked out for so and so is going to show up he's going to come in stage right from a secret you know corridor you've got that all planned out you've got your guys along the route he's going to come up on stage you've got your designated marksman in place all that stuff and then, because he's the dude, because he's the celebrity or whatever, he could decide at the last minute, oh, he's going to his hotel room first, and then he's coming around, and he's, he wants to see all the people, so he's literally going to walk right in the front entrance without any prior acknowledgement. You find out, like, 30 seconds before that's what he's doing, and he's the celebrity, so that's what he's doing. And then guess where all your plans went? Out the window, right? It's just a thing that happens, I can tell you from experience. That you could have all your stuff planned out for a certain venue and for whatever reason flooding you know financial issues whatever the venue gets changed after you've made all your plans and you don't have time to properly write down all the new plans so planning that you may have been doing for months now literally the day before everything changes and and you got to adapt to that and it's not as well planned out as you would have liked to liked it to have been let me tell you also from real world first hand experience comms are rough on this you can imagine what a nightmare it can be for several different organizations to communicate with each other not to mention just for my team and certainly other organizations too I kind of liked having both and I would utilize both I would want guys in like full tactical kit scary visual deterrent Like, don't bring that crap into my house. I would want those guys, and then I would also want guys that were in plain clothes. Sometimes, literally in a three-piece suit. Sometimes, I literally had a guy get confused for a homeless person. And he was one of my armed security guys. Because he was that good at blending in. Like, so, whatever the mission dictates, right? You could be dressed up like a homeless dude, an old, dirty hoodie. You could literally, there were times when I would be in a three-piece three piece suit, which I can't really stand, but I would do it for the mission. Depending on whatever blended in with the environment. I would have guys that I would dictate. Sometimes in plain clothes. Sometimes in full tack gear. Covert or overt. Highly visible to completely clandestine. And other organizations do the same thing. And... You know, you should theoretically, again, have dossiers and pictures, and they should be coordinated 
through the either directly or through the SOC, the Security Operations Command, or all that. That should all be done beforehand. But I don't have to probably tell you that it doesn't always work the way that it's supposed to. So you've got all these different contingents of different people from different organizations trying to work together on these things. And again, it's kind of a twofold thing. You should secure the venue, uh, and that can include anything from we had canines, you know, explosive detection sweeps, you know, prior to and during the event trying to gather any intel on possible threats beforehand and then obviously if anything pops up at the event real world threats that are happening right now and then there's protecting the actual asset you know the principal who who are you trying to protect and obviously there's a balance there, right? You could shove them in a basement locked away under 10 feet of concrete under armed guards, but then they wouldn't be able to do whatever they were there to do. So you have to have this balancing act of this person needs to be able to speak, dance around, you know, sing, perform, give a political speech, or maybe just have dinner at a nice restaurant because that's what they want to do. And all that, and balance that with their security. You can make them more secure, but then they couldn't interact with anybody. You got to balance that, and that's a. It's not the easiest of missions. Let me just tell you. Kind of by definition, these places are flooded with people, right? I would often get the picture. And I remember this very vividly when I was standing in Overwatch uh, for protection. I would just get this idea in my head of. Mmm just cattle because these people were like shoved shoulder to shoulder maybe thousands of them at a time you know just flooding an area just so many people men women and children everywhere imagine trying to find a specific person a specific threat and and i don't different size arenas but imagine thousands of people like, where's Waldo when Waldo has camouflage? As if Waldo is smart and dressing like everybody else. Now, these are just some considerations from some experience in this arena. Something that will probably be a news flash to no one. Also, and I, again, I'm not here to convince you what happened or I wasn't there, and I'm not going to speak to things that I don't know, but. You probably know from just living life in any organization, especially bureaucracies. There are people that are really good and devoted to doing the best job that they can do. There are people that are there for the pension. There may be people there that have the job that maybe you think shouldn't, right? There, or is there, if you get a big enough organization, there are people there that are really good, morally outstanding people, and there are people that are just morally corrupt and decayed. I don't care if it's a group of priests or teachers or police departments. That just is what it is. The fact that you give somebody a tin star and put it on their chest does not change that. These people, the celebrity, the government organization, the private organizations... They're all still just people. Don't idolize them. Don't worship them. They're people. Keep that in mind when you factor in making your decisions. All right, guys. With that, if you're new, because I realize this may attract some new people, you may share this if you feel like sharing with somebody that's not a tactical person, not a gun person, not whatever. If this is your first time listening, maybe just subscribe. All right, the rest of this little plug probably not even for you but if you liked what you heard maybe subscribe if this is not your first radio here and you're a regular listener consider becoming a patron patrons get a lot of cool insider only content they're going to get this content before the general audience does i put it out on the patreon page there should be a link in the show notes consider becoming a patron consider supporting all the buzzwords american veteran owned small business Also, I work two jobs. I still professionally, like, I put on body armor as part of my day-to-day life. I still work as this private security contractor. And there's a reason this is coming out far later than the actual event because I work a lot. 
Ask my wife. I would like to transition to making the podcast more of a full-time income so that I could work less. You want to make that happen. You know, support American small veteran-owned business. You want to make that happen. Consider becoming a patron. Patreon link in the show notes. With that, your tactical tip of the day. You don't have to be some tactical operator in ballistics nylon and uh, wearing a war belt to glean from some of the lessons in this. The five paragraph order. You don't have to do it verbatim. But if you're planning a trip, maybe you're taking an RV around. You know, maybe you're planning on taking a vacation to Hawaii. I don't know. You can use some of these same processes. Don't just wait for something bad to happen and try to react on the fly. You'll do much better in a hairy situation if you have thought about what do you do if. And then what's my backup plan? My contingency plan, my emergency plan. What's the worst possible thing that could happen and then how do I act? Because if you've already thought about it, you'll probably react much better. You don't, again, have to be a tactical operator to do this. You don't have to title it Tactical Operation Order 4. Disneyland, right? You can, you can do it something as simple as pull out the map, and if traffic is backed up, what's your alternate route? If there is some kind of massive event at Disneyland, let's just take that, and everybody's trying to go this way. Maybe look at another way you can get out of Disneyland that everybody's not going to go. Because in an emergency, most people will go out the way they came in, the main entrance. If that's what everybody else is doing in an emergency, probably don't do that thing, right? So, Again, not just for tactical operators. Your tactical verse of the day. From the Holy Bible, the Gospel of Matthew. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Bad things, real world bad scenarios, they can happen very, very quickly. Beware of normalcy bias. Thinking, oh, you know, I've, I've never been attacked violently before. It's never going to happen. Like when things go bad, they can go bad very quickly. Watch and be ready, the Bible says. Jesus says, watch and be ready. It says it more than once. Jesus says something, probably pay attention. If he repeats himself, probably really pay attention. It may be on your final exam. Watch and be ready. With that, thanks for listening and have a blessed day.